This is Kevin Donahue with ProTivity, welcoming you to a new edition of Powerful Insights. Carol Beaumier, a Senior Managing Director with ProTivity, recently moderated a discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion with ProTivity Advisory Board member Evelyn Dilsaver and ProTivity Executive Vice President Susan Hazley. Their enlightening conversation builds on information in a recent issue of ProTivity's Board Perspectives Risk Oversight Newsletter titled Dispel the Myth of Fit, Improve Diversity on Your Board. This is available at ProTivity.com board. Carol is a leader with ProTivity's risk and compliance practice and oversees the firm's Asia-Pacific financial services practice. Evelyn is a recognized leader in building highly motivated teams in the public and nonprofit sector. She is the former president and CEO of Charles Schwab Investment Management. Evelyn is active on several nonprofit boards, including the Commonwealth Club, the NACD NorCal Chapter, and Women Corporate Directors. She also serves as audit chair on both public and private boards, including Temper Sealy, Health Equity, and Blue Shield of California. Susan is leader of ProTivity's Diversity and Inclusion Initiative. She has more than 30 years of experience in providing risk and technology consulting and internal audit services. And now, let's take you to their conversation. We've been talking about diversity in the boardroom for what seems like a very long time now, though I think it's fair to say that the pressure on companies, particularly public companies, to improve the diversity on their boards continues to increase. I think many companies have made significant progress, but there's a lot of work left to be done. So I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you both about this important topic today. Susan, I'd like to start with you. The the discussion around diversity in the boardroom has expanded from a discussion of diversity and inclusion to a discussion of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Could you share your thoughts on why that shift or why that addition is important and, and what it really means? Absolutely, happy to. When we speak um, about diversity in the boardroom, it encompasses a team with many attributes, um, such as education, gender, race, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, it may even be digital savviness or maybe specific areas of expertise. So diversity is really all about difference, but inclusion in the boardroom is about all of the board members' ability to participate and feel valued for their contributions. Equity is all about fairness. It's about access and the commitment to break down barriers, both real and perceived, to achieving diversity and inclusion. Equity should not be include, it should not be confused with equality. Um, a lot of times I, I see this sometimes. Equality is about treating everybody the same, but equity focuses on individual needs. You know, there's, there's a visual that I've seen many times that maybe you've also seen that um, helps me think about this. It's um, a visual of three children that are different heights who are trying to look over the fence and none of them are tall enough. And so equality is about you know, giving these children a box to stand on, but they all have the same size box. If you think about equity um, in that scenario, it would be giving each individual child the size box that they need to be able to see over the fence. And so equity, equity really recognizes that people from marginalized backgrounds or groups often have more barriers to overcome and um, important that we think about this. And, you know, this has been historically the case in the boardroom. Great example, Susan, to explain the concepts. Let me ask a follow-up question of you. Why are diversity, equity, and inclusion so important to boards and to the ongoing success of organizations? Well, there are many reasons. First, um, compelling research asserts a diverse board is not just the right thing to do, but it also leads to improved performance and greater innovation. Um, there are other reasons too. If a board sets a positive tone for DEI, um, that can be a real positive influence for acquisition for talent. And we know that in today's world, even in the pandemic, we are in a war for talent. Um, the companies that broaden their focus on a more diverse talent pool and create equitable and, inc and inclusive environment, I think will attract much more top talent. 
And that starts at the very top at that board level. You know, I think one other point to make um, is that the market is also driving more attention to this topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You're probably um, very familiar with uh, the institutional investors uh, like BlackRock and State Street. You know, they're really sounding the bell both for gender and racial diversity. And uh, recently, the NASDAQ in the U.S. submitted a proposal to the SEC to allow it to require the companies to have at least one woman and one director who is or self-identifies as an underrepresented minority. So there is a lot of change that is currently happening, and it's important that boards pay attention to this. Great. So let, let's talk about how boards can improve their diversity based on our own research and discussions we've had with many directors. We've developed six suggestions for improving diversity on, in the boardroom. And the first is dispelling the myth of fit. Evelyn, could I ask you to comment on why looking for the right fit in board candidates might actually represent an obstacle to diversity? Yes, Carol, thank you. Um, you know, I think we need to redefine what fit means. In the past, fit was a shorthand for saying, looks like me, same experiences, and that's how we defined fit. But fit is really about skills that are needed for the company to succeed now and in the future. So it, it should include skill sets that um, you need for strategies that you are developing uh, in organic and or organic growth, uh, folks who can manage crisis management. We know cybersecurity and technology are huge um, requirements for many companies now, artificial intelligence and the impact it has on a company. So FIT should really start with not looking like me or having the same experiences uh, uh, as I do, but it should be about skills needed. But at the end of it, Carol, you still need a board that is collegial, that trusts each other to do what's right for the company. In other words, there's no um, singular agenda for any one individual that respect and listen to each other. To um, Susan's earlier discussion about how do you have um, inclusion and equity, that's really about listening and respecting each other and somebody who can see the bigger issues. I think part of the old definition of fit we defined it again in shorthand by titles. In other words, I want a CEO or I want a COO rather than uh, defining it by the skill sets that you need because the title may not necessarily um, give everything that you want. So if we stay with that old definition of fit, it will definitely be an obstacle to diversifying your board and bringing in the skill sets you, that you really need for the company to succeed in the future. Great, and it's sort of picking up on the broad de, um, definition of diversity that you both used. Susan, what do you think some of the pitfalls are that boards must navigate to ensure that they are thinking and searching broadly enough and considering you know, all of the potential talent pools out there to uh, find the right candidates? Yeah, you know, uh, as Evelyn said, um, fit, um, can actually be a pitfall also if you think about how fit has been defined in the past. And, you know, I, I do think it can be a key word for unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And it's really important that um, unconscious bias is recognized um, in terms of how we select and, and how we interview and how we obtain um, board members. So I, I think that's one thing that's really important as um, the board thinks about sourcing um, and looking for talent. I also think there are many other options. So for example, you really need to cast a wide net. Um, if you are sourcing you know, with a recruiting firm and they come back and say, well, we just can't find um, talent that has diverse skills, and I think you're looking in the wrong place, there are many opportunities because if, if you do not bring forth a diverse slate, you will never have a diverse candidate that you hire. And if you are bringing a diverse slate, um, 
but you never hire a candidate that has diverse qualities, then um, maybe you have some unconscious bias in your process. So one of the things that you can do is look at different places uh, for different talent pools. So for example, um, women corporate directors or think about Ascend, um, the Registry of Black Corporate Directors or the Latino Corporate Directors Association. There are a lot of areas or a lot of ways that you can source candidates um, in different ways than maybe you have in the past. In the past, I think it's always been looking at the current complement of the board and, you know, who do you know? Who are your friends? Who, who do you think would be a good fit for us? And so it's really breaking out of that dynamic and thinking about other places to look for pools of candidates. Great. We we also talk about the importance of boards staying committed to diversity um, and being courageous. So, Evelyn, it's not really about just bringing on one diverse board member, is it? No, of course not. You know, one member does not make a crowd, and it's hard sometimes to have your voice heard if you're the only member of a diverse uh, background, whether it's bringing on somebody who comes from an entirely different industry, as Susan said earlier, that brings that perspective. Um, you need multiple voices for it to be heard in a boardroom. And a lot of that really depends on how the dynamics of the board work and whether there is power in a boardroom um, being held by one individual. So you do need more than one, just like anything else. Um, I actually think three is a great number in terms of having the power of a, a voice that can make sure that the points are heard um, and that um, the participants in the room can really listen. I also think it's an important number as the rest of the organization looks up at their top leadership team. And if they only see one person of a diverse background, it's not enough for them to feel confident that they will be promoted and recognized in the organization and that there's enough of a voice to make sure the voices lower in the organization are heard. So you want to be able to set the example at the board level, at the executive team level, that diversity is important. And just having one diverse candidate does not do that. And just picking up on that, and Susan, you talked about this a little bit in the beginning. Um, let's talk about the trickle down effect. What does it really mean to have a diverse board and how does that influence the rest of the organization in areas such as recruiting and retention and even overall performance? Well, I think the organization is always looking up, right? So tone at the top, it begins at that board level. And, um, you know, if you have an executive team and eight players in the organization and they look up and they look at the company's board and the executive team and they see a diverse group of leaders um, that attracts them to the company, um, that will help gain trust. And I think if you don't, if you lack that diversity, um, you will likely hamstring the company's efforts to acquire and retain top talent. Um, people really are looking for a culture and an environment that is diverse, that really recognizes and understands difference and um, is accepting of hearing different perspectives. And, um, I, you know, I, I think the board should um, kind of open their eyes to that because people are looking up and it's real important that they set that example. I think there's another question also, though, um, in terms of the composition of the board, and that is aligned with evolving markets. So as an organization, if you are looking to make changes and in, in, in the future and go into, um, you know, changing demographics of your customers and the services that you're offering the market, I think it's also really important that the board is strategic about thinking about the composition of the board and the executive team and are, is that aligned with um, where the organization wants to go and carol picking up on what susan said i think when the executive team um, presents to the board having that diverse board and hearing the thoughts that are coming from each board member from a very different perspective helps that executive leader grow in their own abilities 
to manage their business and think differently about the business and think broader about the business. I think it also helps when, when somebody who joins the management team looks up and sees the diverse board, it helps them um, create more diversity within their own organization. And I think an important part of it is not just bringing on that diverse candidate, whether it's a board member or an executive member, but making sure they have the tools to succeed to, to Susan's earlier point about equity. It's um, not just bringing them on, it's making sure that the surrounding organization and the tools that they have to be able to succeed, giving them exposure to the parts of the organization that will allow them to have a bigger picture of what's happening is an important part of making sure um, the, your diversity efforts work. It, it, I guess picking up on that, Evelyn, I think we'd all agree that board members really need to be proactive. They need to be allies in supporting DEI initiatives. So from your perspective and serving on a number of different boards, in addition to what you just mentioned, what are the other ways that board members can can do this? Well, on several of my boards, we've asked human resources to come back and present metrics. So what are the diversity uh, numbers in the organization? What is pay equity in the organization between men and women, not just men and women, but between officer levels and non-officer levels, between African Americans and whites, between minorities and the rest of the organization, so that you can see for the same jobs, for the same level of experiences, people are getting paid equally um, or, or you know, within a, a fair range of each other. We all, and so we demand that every year and we demand for improvement. The other thing we demand is that for new candidates coming into the organization, that a diverse slate of candidates be presented. And it's now starting to get fed into the um, performance metric systems. So for an individual performer, um, it's usually a combination of individual performance and corporate performance. And in the individual performance factor, we include that if they have openings, whether it's internal or, or external that they're gonna hire, they need to see a diverse slate of candidates. And again, it's HR is uh, monitoring that to make sure that happens. So it starts with metrics and then you start to measure it. And then at some point in time, you may want to include it in your compensation. It's not something I think you start off right away with um, putting it in your compensation metrics unless you're seeing no progress. Um, so you, have to, have mantra, a, you have to have a base. So the old mantra, what gets measured gets improved, certainly oh, yeah. holds true here as well, right? Definitely. So lastly, I, I'd be interested in both of your views on additional ways that board members might be able to promote diversity within their organizations, how they can act, uh, actually serve as those proactive allies and this, from my perspective, would involve things like, you know, identifying um, up and coming candidates within the organization and working with them. But I'm really interested in, you know, ways that that you think can be successful in developing that talent within organizations. Susan, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so. I think it's really important for directors to engage within the organization. I mean, wow, they can expand their networks. Um, you know, and think about, you know, who do I know within the organization? How can I expand that to make sure that um, I'm advocating for women and un underrepresented minorities in the organization? How can I get to know them? How can I um, bring them into my network to help them? And so, I think there's an opportunity to mentor promising executives, but better yet, an opportunity to sponsor them. You know, become that advocate, become that individual that really um, helps them get to that next level. So I, I think there's just a real opportunity to do that. Um, you know, I also think at the board level, it's important that each and every board member kind of self-assess where they are, um, maybe educate themselves and be aware of unconscious bias. 
you know, we all have bias. And um, once you're aware of the biases that you have, then I think it will be really helpful in creating that inclusive culture um, for the board to be able to make sure that each and every board member is being heard. And, um, you know, but if you don't really take that assessment of yourself to see what biases you have, then you're not able to move that forward. And, and I really think that starts with the chair um, to really um, have everybody kind of go through that process to make sure that you have a really good functioning board environment that's very inclusive. Great, Evelyn, anything to add to that? Well, you know, every company is different at different stages of their evolution with respect to this. I think the ESG report that many companies are now starting to include in their 10Ks or as a separate report that focuses on social, which really in many cases focuses on their employees and what they're doing to diversify the organization and promote their employees is one that gets you to sharpen it. So every board should be asking their um, organization, what are you doing for the ESG, ESG report? And which committees of the board is gonna focus on E, environment, the S or the social and G on the governance. In a lot of cases, it does get split among the committee structures. The other thing to pick up on what Susan said is that a lot of companies have um, diversity, diverse, um, organizations inside that promote, um, for example, the Asian organization or the African American organization or the veterans organization with the goal of promoting um, a, a clear understanding of what, what they can do to help the organization succeed and the specific issues they may have as um, an organization. And a board member can participate in those. I've participated, for example, in the Asian organization um, as a lead off speaker for the work that they're going to be doing that day and exploring um, the concerns that they have and what solutions they want to bring forward to the company. Um, I know executives also sponsor many of those organizations. So putting your out, yourself out there and offering to come in and, and talk, to come in and mentor, and to sponsor, as Susan said, some of these organizations is a great way to make sure that your voice at the top is also heard in the middle of the organization and lower down in the organization. I love that, Evelyn. Um, you know, what a, what a great opportunity to really connect within the organization with those uh, employee network groups or employee resource groups. Yeah. Great. Thank you both so very much for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. For more information, read our paper, Dispel the Myth of Fit, Improve Diversity on Your Board. This is available at fertivity.com slash board. I also encourage you to subscribe to our Powerful Insights podcast series wherever you find your podcasts and to rate and review us.